Good morning. Welcome to welcome to lecture twelve of mathematical methods. So I probably spent far too many classes talking about uh, uh, group theory, uh, but now we are coming to I think what uh, more of many people of or among you might uh, like to hear, which is uh, the notion of Lie groups or continuous groups. Right, so does anybody know what, well, okay, well, you probably do, so I'll, I'll just kind of, so what, what, are, what are leaf groups, right? They are continuous groups, right? What do we mean by, by continuous? So, which means that if you have some element of this group, then we can index the elements G as G of X. Where X is a point in some continuous uh, space or manifold. Okay, so if the word manifold scares you, you can just think about space. Okay, so examples are the rotation groups, orthogonal groups, unitary groups, again, the S I hope everybody knows what the S means. S means that you have unit determinant for the group. And then you have a SL2. Well, it can be SLNR. SLNC. GLNR, GLNC. And the thing is that, uh, so again, special means, and so these are all, these are all matrix groups. Right? I mean, they, they all have matrix representation. So O stands for orthogonal, right? Uh, which means that if you have a representation, a matrix representation, then we, then the inverse of this is equal to the adjoint special means that the determinant of the uh, matrix is one. Uh, and if there are no conditions on it, right? If it's just an arbitrary matrix, uh, then we call it that group uh, GL. So G stands for general. And L stands for linear. So S stands for special and O stands for orthogonal. Okay, so these are, and these, these describe, what, what sort of symmetries do they describe? They describe symmetries of continuous symmetries of a system, right? So they describe uh, rotations, translations, dilations. What are dilations? Dilations are mean scale transformation. When you take a, some shape and you increase the sizes, Increase the volume or the you know the length. Then you can have conformal transformations, which are very important. Conformal transformations are those in which 
you don't necessarily preserve the area in going from uh, of upper shape but you preserve the angles between lines then boost right boost are lorentz transformation so those form a continuous group right so apart from the examples i've listed above uh one can also have uh so one can write s slash g all right either you say s or you say g then you can have o u or l which means orthogonal or unitary or linear right and then you can have p comma q i'll tell you in a minute what this means and then you can have r or c this covers most of the most of the groups but uh, apart from r and c that you can have in general you can have any field so this is any number field okay so you can have for instance uh, if i'm not mistaken i might be mistaken uh, you can have finite fields and i think you can also have you can also use the other possibilities of quaternions or or octonions don't worry about these if you don't know what they are if you haven't heard of them so we know what s and g are we know what o u l r right we understand r c or k so what this says is the elements of your matrices are either real numbers or complex numbers or elements in this in this whatever this set of numbers is this finite field what are what is p and q right so p and q so we can think of p as as the number of space dimensions on which this group acts and q as the number of time like dimensions okay now so for example you have so31 okay and we we i haven't put the r or the c it's understood that this is uh the complex set of uh, on the set of complex numbers okay sorry the set of real numbers so this is the and this is called the real lorentz group right so the lorentz group is the group of symmetries of four dimensional space time these are the space directions and there is one time direction right now uh but in general this q does not have to be one it can be more than one so so in all of these cases right you have a matrix representation of the group in question and the matrix has some dimensionality right dimensionality of the matrix is p plus q right so for lorentz you have four four dimensional matrices and so on at least in 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 the fundamental representation okay so uh so every group has a fundamental representation and then it has other representation okay so for so for uh, so you you know um 
so typically for for these for these lee groups uh some group which is uh defined as son or sun or whatever the fundamental representation is typically the n dimensional representation meaning the set of n by n matrices but then you can have other representations which are not uh not of this not of n dimensions it can be of more than n and i think sometimes less than okay but again now what is the dif main difference between these continuous groups and discrete groups for discrete groups right you can define a set of generators so generators are a a subset of your group they are a set of elements right whose repeated application will give you all the elements of the group okay so as an example um you have for this dihedral group d3 the group elements are e uh rotation and three reflections right this is the other group elements and i hope that if you are at least if you have been coming to class or watching the lectures you sh should know by now that what this group uh, structure is so r1 what is this this is a rotation by an angle of how much anybody 120 degrees sir 120 degrees right um so that's 2 pi by 3 right and then what is r2 r2 is r1 squared so you can generate r r2 by using r1 right then you have t1 t2 and t3 so you can take as a set of generators you can take for instance the identity and then one rotation and any one of the reflections so if you combine any one of these reflections uh with a rotation you can generate the other two other two reflections right so what you have is the following right this is a triangle and let's say that i i choose reflections around this along this axis this is my t1 axis right so if i want to generate if i want to ask what are the what is the reflection around around this axis what do i do right i can so i take my triangle i rotate it by an inverse of 2 pi by 3 i perform a reflection across t1 and then i rotate it back by t by 2 pi by 3 right so this is t2 this is t1 right so i can write T two as R two pi by three T one R inverse two pi by three. right. Just visualize it in your mind. 
that so rotations are positive rotations are con are counterclockwise and negative rotations are clockwise so counterclockwise is in this direction and clockwise is in this direction right so when i rotate by an inverse of 2 pi by 3 i take the green axis into the blue axis then i perform a reflection across the blue axis right and then i rotate the system back that gives me t3 same way you can get t3 right so these are your generators but the problem is that so and for any any finite group any discrete group you will always have some set of generators some finite set of generators now the 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 issue is that for a continuous group right what are the generators how should you describe the how should you generate all the elements of the group for instance we can uh, consider the group of translations uh, in the plane okay group of translations in the plane right and this forms a group right because you have how do you define a translation so it doesn't have to be in the plane it can be in any in any dimension right so we define a translation by saying that you start from some point right and you end up at some other point this is how you define a translation right you start at some point x and you end up at some other point x prime and so this is associated with a with a vector right r r is a displacement vector right so any element of my translation group of translations can be written as t of r right so this is an element of the group of translations t of r and what is the what is the product rule for translations right if i take two translations right one by some vector r1 and another by some vector r2 right then the combined translation is what it's just going to be r1 plus r2 right so i can write this as t of r1 plus r2 this is the this is the group multiplication rule and this is also a translation right so we have that what about the inverse the inverse is just given by t of minus r right and the identity identity is just t of 0 right when r is the displacement vector is just 0 the null vector right so now one can ask well what is the what are the is there is there some finite set of subset of translations which i can use as my generator now so before asking this question for continuous translations let's consider discrete translations first
Okay. So what are what is the what are what are discrete translations? Discrete translations are again you have you can and this axis is purely a matter of convention. Okay. These coordinates are purely a matter of convention. They are not what what really matters. So you have a you a discrete translation of a group of discrete Right. If you say that, for instance, if you are in two dimension, that there is a set of vectors of two vectors. Right. Let me call this R A and R B. Then any translation or any element of the group can be written as some integer multiple of R A. Plus some integer multiple of R B, right? So what what does this do, right? What this does is it it takes your plane, right? And divides it up into cells. Like this, right? So these are your these are your cells. And each time you perform a translation, Right, you go from one lattice point to another lattice point. Now, for simplicity, we can consider we can take R A to be uh, the unit displacement vector in the x direction. And R B to be the unit displacement vector in the y direction, right? Now, if I want to take my group of discrete translations, and this also forms a group, as you can easily check. If I want to take my group of discrete translations, and uh, can I can I make some connect it to the continuous case? Right? So if I want to go from the discrete case to the continuous case, how do I do do that? I do that right by taking my displacement vectors. Right, I take my displacement vectors. And make them small. I shrink my displacement vector. So what do I do? What I do is I take the length of my displacement vector, and I take it to zero. So as I do this, what happens? I have a I have a grid, right? The grid is shrinking. So it's becoming finer and finer. And as it's becoming finer, right, almost all the points in the plane will be, will be covered by that grid. Right? So now, when you do this, right? Huh, so coming to, so so in this case, by the way, in this discrete case, you have you have a generator. You have two generators. What are the generators? They are simply translation by R A and translation by R B. And by combining these two, you can make any element of the group. Right? How? You just take translation by, by R A and 
perform that m m times you take translation by r b and perform that n times right you will get a translation by by this amount right so and uh, because you can i mean it's uh, i hope it's easy enough to see that if you take this translation and multiply act m times what you get is translation of m times r a right and also that these individual these two translations they commute with each other because you can go like this and like this first or you can go like this like this right they commute with each other translations commute okay now if you go imagine taking the continuum limit right what happens to the generators right what is the effect of so i'll now i'll write the generator as, as t of x and t of y okay why t of x and t of y because i want to say so t of x represents a translation in the x direction and t of y in the y direction but i have not assigned any magnitude okay so for instance this translation corresponds to a shift by a finite amount this is just a translation in the x direction if i want to specify the amount what do i do i take some real number alpha and multiply by ta right now alpha can be very small or it can be very large and similarly i can have beta ty beta is also some real number right so now these are my generators okay and what are they doing physically right they generate infinitesimal translations right so as an example okay let's consider that we have some function f of x defined on the plane okay it's a function of our coordinate now if i have the translation group which acts on this function right if i have the translation group t of r some element translation by r which acts on this function f of x right what what should i get on the right hand side so for simplicity you can just think about the one dimensional case right so you have a function in one dimension okay so you have some function f of x right and if you translate it by some t of x not right that means you are shifting everything to the right by an amount x not what do i get i get f of x minus x not right so here what will i get i will get f of x minus r okay now this is a finite translation right
okay so if i have an infinite decimal translation what will it do p of x epsilon p of x where epsilon is some number much smaller than 1 some infinite decimal right acting on f of x oh wait yeah or instead of f of x i'll write f of r because yeah. what will this do this will give me f of r minus how what minus e of x comma 0 it's a translation along the x direction by an amount epsilon similarly i have e of this is f of r minus minus sorry so here there is no x it's just epsilon so it's translation by an amount epsilon in the x direction here is translation by amount epsilon in the y direction okay so i mean for the for the case of translations there's uh there is not a great deal to do okay uh there is more that we can do that i have not done which is that uh i have not uh given you some actual concrete representation of the translation group okay uh but we can do that also yeah so we'll we'll do that okay so yeah okay so what what okay yeah yeah got it got it now if you have some function f of x going back to the one dimensional case okay and i write it as f of x minus x not where x not is some small number right i can expand i can tailor expand this as f of x minus x not f prime x right so i'll write this as d by dx of f right then i'll get the next term will be x not square right and so on now all of these terms right this whole taylor series can be written in the following form i can write it as an exponential of minus x not d by dx acting on f of x where now you will see one thing that i have put the derivative operator in the exponential right so what this requires is the just to remind you that if you have an exponential of an operator right where o is any operator i'll put a hat on it to indicate that it's an operator what is this going to be this is the definition of the exponential of any op operator right o can be an operator or it can be a number so in our case in our case our operator is what it's uh, it's let's say our operator is just the derivative okay dx what is o square dx times dx right which is d2x right o to the n is going to be dnx right the nth derivative so you can see i hope that
that what I'm saying over here makes sense, right? That this can be written as this exponential acting on f of x. I can do the same thing for the y, y displacements, right? So if I have exponent minus some y naught d by dy acting on, so now I'll take a two dimensional function. Here I was working with a one dimensional function. I'll take a function in two dimensions. So I'll say f of r now. R has two components, x and y, okay? What is this going to be? This is going to be equal to f of x comma y minus y naught. It will just take the y coordinate and shift it. Similarly, if I take d by dx, act on f of r, what will I get? I'll, I'll shift the, translate the function along the x-axis, right? What if I want to do both of these things, right? What if I want to do both of these things? Then I can do something like this, right? I can say exponent minus x naught dx exponent minus y naught dy f of r, right? What is this going to be? This is going to be f of r minus r naught. r naught is this vector, x naught comma y naught, right? And now here's the thing. When I said earlier uh, that translations commute, what does that mean? Right, what does that mean? That means that if I take these, these dx and dy, I can act on, act with in either way, right? So the commutator of these two operators is zero. That's what, it, what, I, what I mean when I say translation. And these operators, d and dx and dy, these are what I call the generators. For the case of a continuous group. Okay. And these generators, they form something called a Lie algebra. which we'll talk about in greater detail in a, in a little bit, probably in the next class, right? Now the translation group does not hold too many surprises. Why? Because, because of what? Because of, of the fact that the translations all commute with each other. Okay. So now we look at something more, less trivial, rotations, okay? So now, as an example, uh, what we'll do is, we'll again work with functions of, which are functions in the plane, xy plane, and but we'll look at rotations, all right, in the xy plane. So if you want to think in three dimensional terms, that's rotations around the X axis, right? So you can think of it like this. You have your X and Y, right? And then we'll be rotating around the z axis by an angle theta, okay? 
and so we have some function f of x y right it's a function on the plane so it's a map from the plane to the real numbers it can be a complex function also it doesn't matter it's just some function now i perform a rotation around the z axis by an angle theta right what happens to my coordinates under that rotation they change in this way right this is what happens to my coordinates okay and what is this what is this matrix right this matrix is is an element of so2 right the group of rotations in two dimensions it's a special it because it has determinant 1 it's orthogonal and it's 2 by 2 right so2 so you can write this as r theta it only depends on one parameter so we'll write it as r theta right now so what happens to to my function under this under this transformation right f of x y it goes to f of x prime and this what cosine theta x cosine theta minus y sine theta and x sine theta plus y cosine theta right this is how my function will transform now what i would like to do is i would like to write this new transformed function as something okay some operator something in here acting on f of x y right remember that is what i did over here i defined my I, i looked at my new function right my translated function as some object some operator acting on my old function so the question is can we do that and what is this going to be right so once again what we should do is we should consider uh, infinitesimal transformations so in this case infinitesimal rotations which means theta the angle it's much much less than 1 right so i'll write it as r delta theta right now when theta is much less than 1 what happens to uh, the elements of the matrix cosine theta becomes 1 minus delta theta squared by 2 let's say sin minus sin theta becomes minus delta theta plus delta theta cube so the uh, then a minus okay but now if we drop all the terms we are looking at new infinitesimal rotations right so we ignore all order delta theta squared and higher terms okay we want infinitesimal rotation so then what we are left with is 1 delta theta minus delta theta and 1 
right? This is R of delta theta. Now this expression can be written in the following way. Right. It can be written as a sum of the identity matrix plus delta theta multiplied by this matrix. Okay. So can I take five more minutes? Okay, sir. Okay. So this is my matrix. And what, what is happening to my to my function f of x, y? In this expression, in this expression, I can I can uh, what happens to my cosine theta? It becomes one and my sine theta becomes delta theta, right? So this goes to uh, f of x minus y delta theta, right, comma, x delta theta plus y, okay? And remember that delta theta is a small number. So I can also write this as f of x minus uh, some small number epsilon one and y plus some small number epsilon two. What is epsilon one? Epsilon one is minus delta theta y. Epsilon two is delta theta x, right? Okay, and now one can ask, how can I, what, what, what's the next step? Well, the next step is to take this and write a Taylor expansion in exactly the same way that I did for the translation case. So now in this case, if I perform a Taylor expansion, what do I get? X minus delta theta y, y plus, delta theta x. So the zero order term is f of x, y. Okay, what's the next term? The linear term will be minus delta theta y, that's epsilon one, times df by dx, right? Then plus delta theta x, times df by dy, right? This is the linear order term. Then you will have other terms, but they will all be of order delta theta square or higher, okay? Now, if you look at this expression, we can write it as follows, f of x, y, is equal to delta theta times x d by dy minus y d by dx acting on f plus terms of order delta theta square and higher, right? Let's compare this with the expression for the for translations right i have x naught times d by dx so i identified this this quantity this d by dx right what is x naught x naught is the parameter which tells me by how much i am changing the function and then this, this object, this d by dx is my operator. It's my generator, right? 
So if I compare this with the expression for the group of, of translations, so in translations, what do I get? X plus delta X, Y plus delta Y, F of X, Y, delta X, D by DX, F, D by DY, F, and then terms which are of higher, higher order. And then this quantity D by DX and this quantity D by DY, these are my generators, right? So then what is my generator for rotation? In, in analogy with uh, the translational case, this operator is my generator of rotations, right, around the Z axis. And we write this as LZ, right, X dy minus Y dy. This is my generator of rotations. Okay, so I'll stop here because you only have a class that you have to go to. But I think that at least if you've been following this, uh, this, the arguments in today's class, it would be clear to you what is going to happen next. We can do the same thing for rotations in the, in the YZ plane and other rotation in the XZ plane. Right? And if you do that, we will get two more generators. One is LX and one is LY. We'll get three generators all. Those three generators, they will not commute with each other, right? And that non-commutativity will give us the structure of the Lie algebra of the group SO3, the group of rotation. All right. So I'll stop the recording here then.